Hello and welcome to Bloomberg Quint. Uh, we are sitting with JC Parrots of all star uh, charts here on the sidelines of Traders Carnival. Hi JC. First I have to tell you I really, really enjoyed your presentation. Thank I you. don't know much about technicals. I'm a funder person, but still I think it was quite informative. Um, the first thing I want to ask you is about technical analysis. Um, what is the key metric before you execute a trade or rather what are the key variables that you look at before punching any trade? Sure, so what we're looking at is supply and demand. That's really what we're trying to analyze. And it's not about being right, it's mm -hmm. about making money. And there's a big difference. So we're not making predictions. The only thing that we're looking for are asymmetrical risk versus reward opportunities. Because we know, the one thing we know for a fact is that we will be wrong okay. many, many times. So we wanna make sure that when we are wrong, not if, but when we are wrong, that we're gonna lose a little bit of money. And if and when we are right, because that does happen too, uh, we wanna make exponentially greater returns than mm. when we are wrong. So it's all about finding asymmetrical risk versus reward opportunities, and that's really all we're trying to do. So you look at support and resistance levels quite closely? Of course. Uh, why, when you execute a trade, what sort of time horizon you look at? How do you decide that? And how do you decide to put your stop loss? I think that's a great question. And the answer is that it's different for everyone, right? Um, you and I will have different goals. Um, I don't know anything about your portfolio or what your plans are or what other assets you might own. And we all have different sort of objectives. We have different time horizons. We have different risk parameters, right? Somebody who's 20 years old and somebody who's 80 years old are going to have completely different objectives. So me personally, I would make a terrible day trader. So I'd <laughs> stay away from that. So you're not into day trading at no, all? No, thank you. I would lose all my money. I am not, I, you, gotta, you have to know what you're not good at okay. is just as important as knowing what you're good at. So for me, I want to make money this quarter. I don't care what happens today, and I don't care what happens next year. I look out weeks and so months. that's a minimum time horizon, a quarter? I would, and maximum. And maximum. yeah, okay. it's this quarter. So weeks and months is really, you know, some might refer to it as an intermediate term time horizon. Mm -hmm. um, but whatever, regardless of what you want to. No, I was just trying to wonder it. if you get sound sleep or no. <laughs> because if you. Yes, <laughs> you know, if you're not sleeping, it's because your position size is too big. Okay. And listen, I've been there. You know, I'm waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning because my alerts are going off on coffee futures, right? You know, I've been there. Okay. Um, uh, it's, it's not a good way of life, I don't think. Um, you know, we don't, uh, we don't live to work. We want to work to live, right? And I found that the work-life balance is best for me in that intermediate term time horizon. I can sure. go to the gym in the middle of the day or go for a jog or a hike or take a nap and I'm not going to be freaking out because, you know, something's moving by a couple of pennies. Can you talk to us about RSI, which you use very closely? I think that's the main metric in technical analysis that you've adopted in your uh, strategy. Uh, and also tell us what sort of strategy uh, do you believe in, long only or long shot? Sure. Um, well, my number one uh, tool in technical analysis is price, right? Price. That is the number one indicator. And everything other than that is just a supplement to that price. What about volume? I ignore it completely. I just want to make sure that it is a, a stock is liquid enough for me to participate in, and I have a good idea of the ones that do. So volume is not of my concern. Um, I use uh, RSI, which is a 14-period relative strength index, as my momentum indicator of choice. Mm -hmm. I know very smart people that use stochastics or MACD and various other momentum analytics. Me, I have found success with RSI. So if I'm looking at a weekly time frame. I'm looking at a 14-week RSI, and if it's a daily time frame, it's a 14-day RSI. So that and helps you in deciding whether the stock is overbought or oversold? That's exactly right. You know, and people get scared when they hear, oh, JC, I can't buy that stock, it's overbought. Mm -hmm. And I ask them, well, how can an overwhelming amount of buyers possibly be a bad thing, right? Overbought conditions are good. That's a positive. We see overbought conditions in uptrends. That is a characteristic of something positive, not something negative. So it's not something that we want to shy away from. We want to see overbought conditions as confirmation of uptrends and oversold conditions as evidence of selling. You know, that's a, a negative characteristic in my opinion. So we look at markets, to answer your question, in both directions long and short. short of course one of my most successful years of all time was 2008 
right? And you were you, on the right side of the trade. <laughs> you know, listen, sometimes we get lucky and we get one right. All right. <laughs> you know, one interesting thing I heard in your presentation was you gave an example on Bank Nifty and how to chase the trend. And you said instead of looking at weighted average of all the stocks in that index, look at the constituents on standalone basis, give yeah. them equal weightage. Could you explain that more? Is is there a better way to make returns on an index where you're spotting a trend but not to give? Because if I look at Bank Nifty, maximum weightage will be uh, with HDFC Bank. Right, exactly. So I in order to avoid that particular case, and in energy it's even more dramatic, Reliance. where Reliance is half the sector. And in America, we have consumer discretionary where Amazon is 25% of the sector. So in order to avoid uh, giving too much analysis to a, the behavior of a sector when there's one component that's driving it, right? What we do is we equally weight all of the components to get a better idea of what the sector as a group is doing, hmm. as opposed to if you look at Nifty one. Energy, is you're basically looking at Reliance. <laughs> so it's just more information on what is actually happening because remember, it's, it's not a stock market. It hmm. is a market of stocks. So we want to see collectively So how do you play a trend? Stocks. Let's say if you're bullish on energy or you're bullish on, let's say, IT pack, which is doing well, would you go and put your money in Nifty IT or would you put your money in individual stocks? Well, it, it really depends on the situation, right? So we incorporate a top-down approach. Hmm. So if we like stocks as an asset class and hmm. we like Indian stocks or American stocks, then we look for which sectors are the leaders, what sectors are the ones driving, and then within the sector, which stocks are driving that sector. And we want to be buying the strongest stocks, showing the most momentum in the leading sectors. And in some cases, it's just easier, the risk versus reward. Remember I was saying the asymmetrical risk reward? Right. In some cases, owning a sector ETF or something like that will, prevent, will, will uh, provide a better risk reward than an individual stock. So it really just depends on the situation. But that would also mean to adopt a risk averse approach towards investing? Always. Always. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't care where you think a stock is going to go. Okay. I want to know where you're wrong, right? Because there has to be a point between where you buy it and zero where you say, oh, I got it wrong, right? It's not like you get, uh, you know, oh, the stock I bought filed for bankruptcy. I guess I got that one wrong, right? There needs to be, and we need to decide at mm. what point we're going to wave right. the white flag, bef you know, uh, before we even enter the trade. Because once we are in a trade, that's when our emotions and stress levels are elevated. That's when we start thinking emotionally instead of logically. Mm -hmm. And we want to avoid that because we're human beings. We are terrible investors. You know, throughout evolution, we are hardwired to do the exact wrong thing at the exact wrong time when our stress levels are elevated. That JC actually looks at 5,000 charts on a weekly basis. How do you do that, JC? I don't know how other people don't. I, I find just such a huge advantage um, to, to looking at all of these charts to get, get a weight of the evidence approach. And I am very transparent. You know, if you go to my website, All Star Charts, you can just, I lay it all out. Like there's no secret sauce. And I will tell you exactly what I do because you're not gonna do it, right? People might look at 5,000 charts once, but they're not gonna do it every week. And I've been doing it for years. So I think the advantage that we have is that we just put in the work. And you know, people are like, well, I don't have time to do that. And that's fine, because that is what I do, right? I'm not looking at balance sheets. I don't care about the fundamentals. The less I know, the better, right? <laughs> so for me, that is what I do. I look through 5,000 charts. That is my process, period. All right, my last question. What are the Nifty charts suggesting you? The Nifty charts are suggesting to me, in the Nifty 50, I think the line in the sand is 10,500, right? If we are above that, then I believe the risk is higher to new highs. And if we are below that, then I believe the risk is lower. Maybe not a, a severe price correction, but at the very least, opportunity costs. In other words, you could do something better with the money than being uh, nifty. In my opinion, 10,500, that's the line. That's the key uh, level to be watched. At. I think so. Okay. Thanks a lot, JC. It was a pleasure speaking to you. Thanks for having me.